podcast where I, your host, Andrew Ingram, read a story from my collection, Midnight Thoughts, to you, uh, the, the internet. Uh, you might hear some thunder in the background this time around, which is apropos, because we're reading a, a story about monsters today, a family of monsters. I'm not going to get too much into the weeds with it, but, but I think it's kind of fun. I wrote this story... Uh, three months into COVID or so, right when things were starting to get dark, and I don't know, it just, uh, there's there's something about this story that makes me smile, and uh, I hope it does the same for you. As always, if you'd like to read ahead, you can find Midnight Thoughts, the short story collection, on Kindle or in paperback on Amazon, or you can just, you know, shoot me a message, and I will probably send you a copy. Uh, if you hear rain and lightning and stuff in the background just look at it as uh as atmosphere because well i'm recording this the day before it comes out and that's just the way things are gonna go all right are you ready for it this is dinner time mother set a final dish on the dining room table and straightened to examine her work perfect she thought then took a deep breath. Supper's ready, she called and grinned from ear to ear at the whoops of hungry children and the clatter of feet on the rickety old stairs. It looks wonderful, dear, father said, wrapping his arms around her waist from behind and kissing her neck. Oh, thank you, love, mother said, leaning back, pecking him on the lips. But you did the hard part. Gross, little Timmy said from the dining room doorway. Tim didn't wash his hands. Did too, Margo, little Timmy said. Mom, Margo's lying. Oh, hush, Margo. Nobody likes a tattletale, mother said. Timmy, go wash your hands in the kitchen. Does your father need to watch you do it? The boy's shoulders slumped. No. Use soap, father called, as li little Timmy shouldered his way through the saloon door, separating the kitchen from the dining room. And a few moments later, mo mother heard the running of water and the lathering of soap. What are we having anyway? Margot asked. Why your favorite, dear? Mother said. Margot gave a little squeal. You mean, they're clean, little Timmy announced, bursting through the swinging kitchen doors, hands held aloft, dripping. You're supposed to try them, weirdo, Margot said. Oh yeah, the boy gave a devilish grin and sunk his hands into her thick woolen jumper. Ugh, Mom! Margot shoved her brother away and straightened her sweater. Timothy Jackson Talbot, what has gotten into you today? Mother said. Sorry, Mom. Little Timmy tried and failed to look contrite. Don't apologize to me. Apologize to your sister. Sorry, Margo, he said with a slight smirk, but Mother let it go. All right, sit down, everyone. Dinner is getting cold, Father said. Wow, Mom, this looks amazing. Thank you, Timmy, but you should thank your father, Mother said, shoveling a few pieces of deep-fried entrails into the boy's plate. He's the one who went hunting last night. Thanks, Dad, he said, picking up a piece of intestine with his fingers and popping it into his mouth like a sweet. Can I go with you next time? Heavens, Timmy, Mother said. Use a fork and don't speak with your mouth full. It's all right, dear, Father said. A rib slathered in succulent barbecue sauce gripped between his fingers. We're hunters at heart, and hunting is messy business. Of course you can come with me, Tim but only to watch and learn. We've got to put some meat on your bones before you can take down big game like your old man. Hooray! Timmy cheered and dug into his entrails with abandon. Margo, who'd been leaning over her blood and brains pudding, slurping contentedly, cocked her head to the side and asked, Who was this anyway? What was that dear? asked Mother, who'd been scrubbing grease off little Timmy's cheek and had yet to take a bite of her own dinner, lightly seared liver flanked with knuckle bones. I was just wondering who he was, Margot said. Somebody we know? One of my schoolmate's parents? You never really talk about it. Margot, I don't think this is appropriate dinner conversation, Mother said, giving Father a meaningful so sidelong glance. Father cocked his head to the side in a mirror of his daughter's expression for a moment, then set the rib back on his plate and cleaned his mouth and fingers with a cloth napkin before saying, Perhaps we should discuss it, my love, after all. There are so many more ideas in the world than when we were, when we were young. It's only natural Margot would ask questions at her age. 
Mother froze with a bite of liver halfway to her mouth, looking unhappy, and said, Fine, but you're handling this one, dear. I haven't the stomach for it. Why does Margot always want to talk about boring stuff? Little Timmy piped up. I want to talk about the army ants outside. I captured some of their scouts, and they want to take over the whole... Hush, Timothy, Father said. Margo brings up an important question, and it's something everyone in the family has to ask at some point. He turned to his daughter and said, First, no. We don't know this man. I found him hitchhiking near the highway. He said he'd lost his family in an accident and started wandering across the country six or seven months ago. Even he wasn't sure where he was going or why. That's so sad, Margot exclaimed. Is it? Humans die. That's what they do. It's what they've always done. Why does it matter if it's today or in a century to us who will live forever? But Dad, they think and make jokes and sing songs just like we do. Don't they deserve to live out their lives? Father gave a thoughtful nod and picked up his half-eaten rib, inspected it for a moment, and took a bite, then said, Margo, do you know how many of their kind have killed over the years? No, neither do I. Thousands by now, I'd imagine, he said, taking another bite. Usually, Mother would admonish him for speaking with his mouth full, but she kept her eyes forward, expressionless. Do you know how many people died in the nuclear blast at Hiroshima in 1945? Father continued. No. Margo's voice was a whisper. About 145,000. Another 30 or 40,000 died in Nagasaki a few days later. These animals killed hundreds of times more of their own in an instant than I have in more than a century on this earth. They're like lemmings with overdeveloped brains, running off cliffs of their own making. My teacher said lemmings don't actually run off cliffs, little Timmy interjected. It's what do you call it? A something legend. Urban legend, mother muttered. Yeah, urban legend. My point is, father continued, although they speak, although they sing and make art and automobiles and aeroplanes, Humans are just animals, self-destructive, pitiable animals. We eat their flesh because without it we'd wither, grow weak, and die, just like them. And besides, he said, pointedly snapping the ribbon too and sucking out the marrow, they taste wonderful. Margot gave father a hard look, glanced at her mother, who still stared blankly at the wall, and finally at little Timmy, who'd been gnawing on intestines throughout the conversation. Finally, she dipped her spoon in her steaming bowl of blood and brains and said, They are tasty, before slurping up a mouthful. Mother relaxed instantly, her gaze shifting to little Timmy's plate. Eat your eyeballs, son. Ugh, they're slimy, the boy protested. They're good for you, boy, father said. Help you grow up to be big and strong so you can hunt humans like your old man. The boy grimaced, popped an eyeball into his mouth, and chewed with an, inc with an audible squelch. Yuck! The topic of conversation moved on to the children's schoolwork, and before dinner ended, they joked and laughed as if there had been no awkwardness at all. At Mother's direction, the children cleared and washed the dishes, while she and Father retired to the living room for a well-deserved nightcap. So that's dinner time. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, like I said before the story, if you liked that, you can always buy the book on Amazon. And if you didn't, uh, you'll probably like the next one. That's the beauty of a short story collection. They're all different. If you want to follow the things I do, you can check me out on Instagram at Andrew Ingram 88 or on Twitter, I guess, at Drew Joker Ingram. Uh, please like and subscribe to this podcast. That always helps the show grow. And uh, leave a comment on Instagram or a review or whatever they call them. Frankly, I don't care, but I would like more people to find this, and that kind of thing helps. Next week, we've got one of the shortest and most experimental stories I've ever written. It's called Be Cool. Looking forward to it, and I hope you are too. Have a good one.